We are three. But we speak the words of many. Of health workers in the community. Of doctors, administrators, consultants and educators. Of nurses and patients. We come from rich and poor nations. We're African. European. Australasian. Latin and North American. Yes, including Canadian. We have one thing in common. The belief that things must be done differently. Better than before. Much better than before. Something happened I couldn't ignore. It was a winter's day, totally ordinary. I'm a physician. Every day I see 45 patients, sometimes more. In addition, I visit the sick at home or speak on the phone. I eat on the go. I love what I do, but it's a 12-hour day on replay. I work till I drop. It never stops. Nothing bad happened that day, but for some reason, I was in disarray. I don't know why. I met my dad, and I began to cry. I was 42, I said. I can't do this anymore. That day, something broke. I knew something had to change. The system had to change, and the change was me. I had to be the change I want to see. Even before the pandemic, burnout was endemic. Now we're giving even more, drawing on reserves that deplete our core. If we want to care for others, we have to care for ourselves. It's vital for our mental health. Ask anyone why attrition is so high year on year and the answer's clear. Chronic, excessive workload, blame and fear. Here's what's at stake. In a blame culture, staff hide their mistakes. And when you don't know what the mistakes are, how can you raise the bar? What lessons can you take? What improvements can you make? I did a survey and was shocked to find nearly half were scared to speak out. On top of this, we had 80% burnout. When morale hits the bottom, the atmosphere's rotten. Mistakes are made everywhere, which has a direct effect on patient care. Doctors are accused, hospitals get sued, staff are named and shamed, and the cycle of blame continues. We had to turn this on its head. Move to a restorative culture instead. Ask who was hurt by this, and what can we learn? I remember the resuscitation of a newborn. There was an argument on the ward between a junior doctor and a nurse who had been there 20 years. It got really fraught. The doctor cursed the nurse and sent her out. We're not taught to listen to what others have to say because health education is done in a hierarchical way. Fortunately, the baby survived, but poor communication can lead to complications. To avoid these models, we implemented huddles where everyone from patients, physicians, nurses, to clinicians meet many times a day to discuss what each case will need and build consensus on how to proceed. We also have debriefs to list what went well and what was missed. And we talk about how we're feeling. It's a process staff find very healing. All the numbers show outcomes are much better. And burnout is half what it used to be. We're not there yet, but we're on the right trajectory. Compassionate leadership is about co-design and co-creation from everyone in the organization. There are four steps to compassion. Listen. Understand. Empathize. And then take action. I'm from a country with high maternal mortality. Now, after every death, we do an audit to learn how we could avoid it. We identified three sources of delay. Firstly, the mothers may be in remote locations or not have the information to recognize early signs of complications. Secondly, did the primary healthcare facility lack skill or ability? Finally, did the hospital make a wrong turn? There is no blame, we just want to learn what to change or who to train. The results have been stunning. Deaths have halved, five years running. I worked at an inpatient psychiatric hospital. Staff talked about patients in terms of their diagnosis, as if they weren't humans, just a neurosis. There's a borderline personality disorder in room four. The manic depressive is lying on the floor. On arrival, they were questioned, searched, given meds, led to a sterile room with a hospital bed. Each week, the patient would meet all the staff for a review. The staff sat behind a table. It was like a zoo. Patients know they have to say certain things to get out, even if they're having suicidal thoughts or their sanity's in doubt. They have to say they're OK or they'll be forced to stay. It was really inauthentic. There had to be a better way. 
I packed my case and set up a place for people with addictions. We treat our guests like humans, not a pathology. They're welcomed with a pot of tea. Their rooms are bright and comfy. 80% of the support staff are former addicts. They understand shame and despair because they've been there. Patients know they care, and outcomes are beyond compare. I was caring for a young mom with many an affliction, mental health, sexual abuse, drug addiction. She needed a lot of care, but was rejected everywhere. The addiction unit refused to help because of her mental health. The psychiatric unit wouldn't take an addict. So her options were restricted because the agencies weren't communicating. These silos are really frustrating. I brought the agencies together to see whether we could work better to serve these patients and sow the seeds of stronger relations between our organizations. We embarked on a process of co-creation which led to several innovations like sharing our learning and training, broadening our vision and building trust. The big shift in quality came with the decision to switch to a common policy. We are patient advocates. I lost my daughter because they diagnosed her brain tumor as epilepsy. Our baby boy was brain damaged because they didn't check for connectorus when he had jaundice. The medical profession is frightened to partner with patients who've been harmed. They're scared of being exposed. They get alarmed. I wanted to get everyone at the table. They said I was ignorant and unstable, but I persisted. And now, because of me, there's a patient on every ethical committee right across the country. We changed the standard of care. We wouldn't let it rest until the guidelines on jaundice said they have to test. As parents, our desire is to make sure that these things are never repeated. We burn like fire and won't be defeated. We're not just patients. We are change agents. When you see a baby not getting optimal care, it's really hard to bear. Their clothes often soiled and smelling, some with IV swelling. Sometimes there's 15 babies and only one nurse in ICU. How much can one nurse do? We're in a public hospital catering for the poor and all the parents were outside the door. They'd grab my arm. Doctor, no one talks to me. How is my baby? They're suffering stress and separation anxiety. One day, I had an idea. We're so desperately short-staffed, would it be so daft to draft these women to help their babies in ICU? The nurses were bemused by this new direction. You can't expose preterms to germs and infection. The mothers will get in our way. I thought that's what they'd say, but I pushed it through and we had to train them in what to do, how to wash their hands, how to put on protection, keep everything clean. But the mothers were so keen, even changing a nappy made them happy. A mother's dedication is a powerful medication. We can learn so much from mums because love impacts outcomes. They would instantly report anything wrong and it wasn't long before the results began to show. All that physical contact made the baby strong. It started as an HR solution, but it's turned into a revolution. There's been a ripple effect that I didn't expect. The mothers have gained confidence and self-respect. They have new skills, which is empowering. I see uneducated women flowering. And what they've learned will spread to the future and beyond the home to their daughters and friends having babies of their own. And for the nurses, as they're released from tasks that require less skill, they can focus more on babies that are ill. Some people think that family-centered care is about passive participation. But for me, it's about transformation. I am a nurse. In my country, when a baby is born with disability, the mothers are blamed, accused of infidelity and shamed. Some babies are abandoned, killed or maimed. There was a baby with anencephaly. A part was missing from her brain. They denied the baby oxygen and a drip. It was inhumane. The mother and nurses refused to touch her for fear of bad luck. The consultant told me off for picking her up. I told him never again to say that to me. I have given my blood, paid for their surgery, even set up my own spina bifida charity. Every baby deserves to live or die with dignity. No discrimination, no rejection, no stigmatization, no dehumanization. 
We don't know how many babies are born with anomalies because we don't count them. They are dismissed like they don't exist. Without data, I can't make a case to the powers that be because there's nothing on which to base a policy. I was training to be a surgeon and then my dad died. And I realized that I could save more lives if I worked in QI. That's quality improvement. Let me explain why. My dad was diabetic. He got a blister on his foot that went septic. His surgery was delayed twice and he paid the price. They gave him too many steroids. He became bloated and was seriously affected. His wound got reinfected. He grew weak, he couldn't get up, he needed to eat. The nurse told my sister to give him some liquid, so she did, but they didn't say he had to sit up. She lifted his head and offered him a drink from the cup. It was a big mistake. He started to aspirate. He was in a terrible state and didn't recuperate. It wasn't fate that took him away. It was a catalogue of mistakes. And he wasn't the only one who died this way. Their death certificates will say they died due to complications from the disease. But my father didn't die from diabetes. I don't blame the doctors. It's the system. We don't know we're making mistakes because we're not looking for them. In QI, one stitch saves nine. Imagine you have two boxes of insulin, both look the same to you, but one is 40 and the other 100 are you. Each requires a different syringe, but they look the same too. They're in the same fridge, the same drawer. They get moved every time anyone opens the door. The doctors are tired. Some work 36 hours non-stop. If you give 100 IU to someone who needs 40, their blood sugar will drop. They'll fall unconscious and could never come back. It's so easy to give the wrong volume from the wrong pack. We changed the color of the boxes to make it simple for the doctors. These improvements in safety and hygiene save lives. Yet we face resistance from some physicians, an insistence that they know best to them. It's an imposition. They're simply unimpressed. After a safety review, we discovered that these doctors actually knew the right thing to do. They just weren't seeing it through. They weren't incompetent, just overconfident. So instead of getting into a fight, I asked them to teach everyone how to do it right. And when they become the guru and guide, they couldn't be seen to let standards slide. I used to work in real estate. One day, my daughter came by in a terrible state. What is it? I feel frightened and full of dread. Something's not right in my head. She catalogued her fears and burst into tears. I started to research mental health. In our town, there had been a cluster of suicides. No one had noticed the early signs. I set up a charity and we had a lot of success at spotting signs in teens who were getting depressed. But I began to question if we were leaving it too late because research shows that anxiety emerges before the age of eight. Why wait until a teen's in a dark space? Shouldn't we focus on preventing it happening in the first place? I had an epiphany. We were talking about depression and anxiety. Instead, we should be talking about well-being and vitality. As a rule, we should start teaching positive health at school. We need to shift our attention from the purely diagnostic towards well-being and prevention. What's better? Provide folic acid ahead of time or treat a baby with a deformed spine? Deal with the causes of addiction at an early age or treat an addict at a later stage? Have a teenager commit suicide or spot the signs before their mental health slides? In rural Liberia, community health workers are showing the way. They visit up to 60 households every day. Even if no one is ill, they knock on the door. They improve sanitation, prevent disease, and so much more. Why wait till it's too late, when you can take action before? I'd forgotten the art of healing, that feeling that happens between two human beings. We turned it into a transaction with no genuine interaction. We need to care for ourselves and look after our health. Listen to each other as sisters and brothers. Empower staff, patients, fathers and mothers. Break down silos and hierarchies in health education. Cheer innovations across nations. Make early intervention. Focus on prevention. Anyone, anywhere can be a change maker. If we're going to make progress, we all have to take part in the process. Together, we can make it better.
We know that the first step is hard. If you're not sure where to start, begin with your heart.